So, thank you all for coming to the first We Heart You Recovery in Our Community event. It's so great to see so many people for this important event and wearing some great t-shirts. Nonetheless, this truly shows that when given the chance, a community will step up, show support, and take action. My name is Patrick Riley, and I'll be your MC for the day, either fortunately or unfortunately. Um, I almost just said my name is Patrick Riley again, but I will. My name is Patrick Riley. Uh, I am a, during the day, I work as a uh, clinic supervisor, clinic manager for a opiate treatment program in Milwaukee called Community Medical Services. Uh, I'm personally in recovery. Um, the last day that I had to use was May 15th, 2009. Um, thank you. Um, it's one part of uh, who I am, and that one part allows me to be who I am. And some of those things are uh, a father, a husband, a son, um, a brother, a sister. No, I'm not a sister. A brother. Um, what else? Um, uncle, yeah. 20, 30, no, 30, almost 30 times. I'm the baby of 10, so Irish Catholic family. Um, lots of Jameson and Catholic. So, um, But uh, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, I would like to thank Jennifer and, and all those that asked me. And with that said, um, if I do anything uh, wrong, it's Jennifer's fault. Um, she's the one that asked me. So, All right. Uh, more importantly, thank you to our event sponsors, Amcor Cares Foundation, Breakwater Coalition, Oshkosh Area Community Foundation, the Opioid Response Network, Rogers Behavioral Health, and Theta Care Foundation. If I mispronounced any one of those, I'm very sorry, sorry. What happens when you get in front of people and you can't speak? I can say all those words. Maybe I just need to loosen up a little bit. All right. Also, a big thanks to the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and the UW Oshkosh Police Department for helping support this event, as well as Winnebago County Health Department, Solutions Recovery, Breakwater Coalition, and Winnebago County Overdose Fatality Review, OFR, if you're in the know. If you are part of any of those groups and you're able, can you please stand up? There's more than one. There we go. I didn't say sit down. Just kidding. I've, I've never been able to like, look directly at a police officer and tell him that he didn't do as I said. <laughs> Not going to miss that opportunity. I was on the other side of that multiple times. All right. After dealing with a pandemic, a continued epidemic, and generally crappy times, ooh, getting saucy, uh, crappy times, uh, we are thankful to be together. We purposely postponed this event so we could be in person as a community. It is an opportunity to have people in recovery feel acknowledged, valued, and heard. Today, we, you will hear many stories of inspiration, grief, and success. Lives were cut way too short, and we can pay tribute to those by changing our community to one that welcomes second, and third, and fourth, and fifth, chances. Yeah. Side note, to make this about me, because it is, um, I first tried to get sober when I was 21 years old. I didn't get sober until I was 29. There were multiple, multiple, multiple attempts and different ways of that attempt, uh, and I'm grateful to all of those different attempts and all the different people that came in my way between the ages of 21 and 29. I was offered third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth chances. So I think it's important to acknowledge what your community just said there is that is going to help create change. Even though you probably have a lot on your plate and there is something waiting for you to do outside of this room, we ask, you, we ask that today you first be present, be mindful, and be intentional. Many have lost loved ones. Many have, ha many have their own stories of addiction. 
And many have seen the same side of addiction every day of their career. We're trying to shift mindsets, so please be mindful that someone else's view may be different than yours, and they may also have a different story than yours. I feel like that was written directly towards me, so thank you for the reminder. With that, I'd like to now introduce County Executive John Damel and Oshkosh Mayor Lori Palmari. I got it right. Yeah. Both supporters of this event and the work that is being done in this community. So first John and then Lori, they'll talk about why this event is important and why we need to support recovery. That was good. I actually uh, prepared a speech. I've learned through executive coaching I have to do this. I can't just riff. Things go awry, right? All right, I'm very honored and humbled to be here today. I welcome you all to the first We Heart You Recovery in Our Community Conference. It is empowering to see so many organizations and community members here to highlight how large the fellowship is. I'm excited for the collaboration that can result as conferences such as this. This conference emboldens all the things that are important to me. Communication, collaboration, growth, and reform. We need to tell our stories. We need to work together on common issues. Expand our resources when it comes to recovery services and reform how we identify and treat addiction. We can change or we can affect change when we do all these things together. I can promise you that the county will be here to do what we can in all these initiatives. Some of you may know that I am no stranger to recovery programs. My wife, Ann, and myself are both recovering gambling addicts. When I first ran for office, I was advised to scrub all my social media platforms of anything referring to my gambling addiction. I did the opposite. I leaned into it. I told my story. It's so what we need to do. We need to tell our stories and encourage others to come forward with theirs as well. We need to be the example for those, for others who are struggling, that hope for recovery is not only possible, but probable. And that not only can they overcome their struggles, but they can excel in their lives when they find recovery. My family also suffered watching my brother go through his struggles with addiction. I remember telling him that he had no idea how many people were waiting on him to get better, people he had yet to meet. Today, I'm thrilled to say that my brother has been sober for over two years Woo! and is not only here today, but he is also serving as a peer support specialist and recovery coach. I am proud of your journey and proud of who you have become. Recovery is not only possible, but it stands here before you today and myself and my wife and my brother and many people around this room. All right, anybody in recovery, can I see hands raised? All right, anybody not willing to admit that yet? You want to raise your hand now? <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm very proud to welcome you all to this conference. This is only the beginning I am very excited for what the future may bring. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John, for sharing your story. Welcome. This is truly amazing to see this community come together on this topic, <clears throat> the topic of stories. How many people recognize this symbol? I hope you can see it out there. It is the semicolon. How many people know what that semicolon symbol stands for? 
It's when the author could end a sentence but chooses not to. Our story, your story, isn't over yet. At the age of 31, Amanda Bluel, who started the semicolon project, passed away five years ago this week after starting this project, which has had global reach. I was asked to talk about what this means to me personally and to us as a city, this event. When I was in the foster care system in the early 1980s, my adoptive father traded me for a bottle of Canadian, a silver lighter case, and other miscellaneous drugs. He eventually got sober, and at the age of 37, with no recovery community and deep shame, drowned himself in the river. I had found my mother several times after she attempted overdoses from despair and isolation of living with this family disease. At the age of 14, I too attempted suicide. My story wasn't over yet. In recent years, close family members have struggled with suicide, opiate and alcohol addictions, and mental health. Their story isn't over yet. Our children and teens are giving up because that's what they see. My family members who are in recovery now, their story isn't over yet. So what does this mean for our city, this event? This event <clears throat> is evidence of an abundant community of resilient people. We need to build the recovery community here and now. There's a saying, if you see it, you can be it. People need to see what that looks like, what hope looks like. Their story, our story, isn't over. We know that depression and other mental health issues co-occur with substance and alcohol use disorder, impacting youth, families, neighborhoods, businesses. The family disease diminishes our abundance. The stigma must end. Conversations must begin and continue with healing resources being made available and shared to provide hope and rebuilding together. Our story isn't over yet. Please break the stigma. Talk and care about one another. Thank you. Your Honor, thank you. County Exec, thank you. Um, nope. It's always impressive when leadership shows courage. So thank you very much. Um, thank you both, John and Lori, for your leadership and realizing how important this is for our communities. We'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge a few attendees. Um, if there are any other... Um, Sorry, I'm just still affected. I appreciate your courage. Um, are there are any other elected officials in the room? If you could please stand, so if you're able, if we can acknowledge you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, This event is very much one of storytelling and vulnerability, as we were just shown. I'd like to introduce someone local who is willing to share his story. Please help me welcome Kyle Thibodeau.
Everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, so I'm Kyle Thibodeau, and I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, I did write a speech, but I was not uh, given the executive coaching to bring it with me and read it. <laughs> so I have some note cards, and we'll see how closely I stick to those. Um, I first entered attempts at recovery in 2012, actually 2010, I'll say. Um, and I did not get into active recovery until 2012. And five years into that, I had a relapse, and now I'm about five years on from that. <clears throat> so my case is not unique. It's not rare. It's not unheard of. I'm not special in any way. I just showed up. I did some work. I continue to do the work and be willing. And from a really somebody you don't really want to have around in society, we'll say, somebody who's taking resources from the police department, from uh, the county, from hospital stays to um, homeless shelters. I can go on and on with where I was. And uh, to be that person in my lifetime, And then to be invited here to speak is just, it speaks wonders what recovery can offer. <clears throat> okay, off to a good start, crying. Um, so today, I'm very different from the person I just shared uh, what I was like, I am married, I'm a homeowner, I have a, uh, a degree from college, I have a daughter, uh, I'm involved in my mother's and father's life and all my brother's lives, and I'm an active member of this community and uh, really grateful to be so. Um, I grew up in Appleton, you know, I came from a middle class family, there's nothing real special about us. Um, you know, I had everything I ever needed um, and most of what I wanted. Um, you know, we, we never went without anything. Um, there was a lot of love in the house, and uh, so I didn't have any real traumatic events in my, in my life that, you know, may have led me to drink in the manner that I did. Um, my parents separated when, they're, uh, when I was eight, and, uh, you know, that's as close as I can get to trauma, and that's, that's not trauma as I've come to know it. Um, both of them are in my life and they're, they're friends and they talk and I'm really grateful for that. Um, both sides of the family, uh, heavy drinkers, Wisconsin, who would have thought. Um, none of them are alcoholic like me. I didn't start drinking until close to the end of high school, maybe middle of high school. And it was very rare, um, you know, I can't buy it anywhere, so, you know, it just happened when it happened. But uh, towards the end of high school, I know it started to really take a, a more uh, influential role in my life. I used to tell myself this story that uh, between the summer of high school and college that three of my best friends and I got together and decided, you know, we're going to build our tolerance so that we're not that guy when we get to college, right? And I've told that story a lot. And I don't think it's true. I think, I think I made that pact, and they were just along for the ride, and they've gone on to lead very normal lives. Um, I was very successful in accomplishing that goal, um, probably to my detriment. Um, so I went off to, to college. I uh, initially went to the University of Minnesota, and... Uh, at orientation for that, I met the first love of my life. And we were together for about a year and a half until she um, broke up with me. It was very unexpected. Um, and over that year and a half, drinking was more and more a part of my life. You know, on the weekends, partying. During the weeks, on occasion. Um, you know, I'd already begun to start skipping classes and wasn't paying attention to my schoolwork. 
And then when, when she, she left me, it just devastated me. And I had no tools to deal with it. And it was at that time that I discovered that alcohol not only provided me excitement and fun and adventure sometimes in my life, but it also helped me to heal, to not feel <laughs> the emotions I did not want to feel. Um, I don't think that made me alcoholic, that event, but it definitely taught my brain something that maybe it didn't know prior to that. Um, so my college career progressed uh, not very favorably to me. Uh, drinking really took over, and uh, I eventually failed out of school. You know, I felt really embarrassed and ashamed. I was fired from a job due to my drinking, and uh, you know, I had to I had to raise the white flag. This was back in 2008, long before I actually got sober. And I said, "Mom, Dad, you know, I have a problem. I, I need to come home." Um, they were grateful for that call. They they were aware there was a problem before I did. So I came home. I got a job and I tried to get resettled. And uh, my family and I had no clue, no clue what alcoholism was. We knew I drank too much. So I stayed sober for a month or so before I started drinking again. And it really escalated um, from there. I, I eventually became a daily drinker. Um, you know, I could not eat without drinking. I could not sleep without drinking. Um, I could not go to work without drinking. Um, it really controlled my life. I w took some time this morning to kind of reflect back on on what my life had been, and, and uh, I was listening to, to somebody um, talk on, on YouTube, and they were relating the idea that the addiction feels like air to people like me. My body, my mind, my soul felt like if I did not have alcohol, I did not have air to breathe, and I would go to anything to get that back in me. And I lived with that for eight years. Whenever I was not around alcohol, I thought about alcohol. I always had to make sure I had enough alcohol. When was my next drink going to be? Where was I going to get it? How soon could I get to it? That was my life. That's what it looked like. Um, I found my way into treatment. Actually, I think my dad found my way into treatment. Um, and uh, I went to the Mooring House up in Appleton. It was a great program, part of Apricity. Um, and there, I was separated from alcohol, was taught some tools to live, and developed no recovery program that would sustain me outside of treatment. Um, I was there for quite a while, probably longer than most, <laughs> you know, sober. Um, but I was um, separated from alcohol long enough that I was able to be diagnosed with um, clinical depression and anxiety that had gone untreated for a long time. Um, so I was able to get on medication for that. I'm very grateful because uh, I still need to take it today, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I have depression or anxiety or a mental illness today. It's just part of who I am, and I, I treat it as best I can. And you know, I'm an alcoholic, I have a uh, mental illness, and I still function just fine in society and get invited to speak to a bunch of important people. Um, <laughs> I think I was given 10 minutes to speak. I'm probably at about 14 now. Um, so anyways, uh, after treatment, I, I quickly went back to drinking, and, and things really went downhill quickly. Um, my parents would take me uh, back in uh, over and over again. You know, I was very acknowledged that I should not be drinking. I knew I should not be drinking. I couldn't help it. My parents didn't want me drinking, of course, because they were watching me kill myself. Um, and they didn't know any better how to help me. They tried. They took me back in. They showed me love. Until the day they didn't. And... Um, 
very grateful for that day. And they got to the point where they just said, we can't. Can't do it anymore. And I was put out on my own with no, nobody there to catch me. And um, at that point, I was, you know, drinking very heavily, still totally dependent upon alcohol, totally hopeless. I was not treating my depression. And uh, it was just, it was very, very, very painful. Uh, it wasn't long after that that uh, I found my way into the Appleton Warming Shelter, homeless shelter, I'm not sure what it's called. Um, but I had thought for many years about suicide and never acted upon it. Within a month, I had attempted suicide. And for some miracle, a friend of mine found me and saved my life. Um, Doctors in the state don't like it when you try to commit suicide. They uh, intervene. Um, so I was given the opportunity to work with the social worker, go to treatment again, and, and was given a second and a third and a fourth and a tenth opportunity at recovery. Um, like I shared before, I'd been to treatment, and uh, I developed no program of recovery that would sustain me outside of uh, treatment, and I knew this loud and clear. Um, so I dove headfirst into 12-step programs. Um, that's what's kept me sober one day at a time uh, outside of treatment. I'm very grateful for the community support, the psychiatrists, the social workers, the police, the medical workers, the um, county health, the... I'm probably missing some because I really utilized all the uh, resources that our community had to offer. So I've been sober for a while to now, and uh, I'm very grateful for that, obviously. Um, you know, I had my life back. I graduated from UWO just a few years ago. Um, I have a successful career. My boss is here today. Awesome. Um, you know, that, that's why we're here, is to, to have the community be here and support us and reduce that stigma as much as we can. My life is very different. I have a wife, I have a child, I'm a homeowner. You know, I'm not absolutely miserable every single day. I'm able to give back, and most of my days are happy days. And even when they're not, they're not that bad. So I guess I just want to say thank you to the community for being there for me when I needed it, and I'm very privileged to be there for you in the limited resource that I can offer. So thank you all for being here. And now to our keynote. Lauren Sisler is a two-time national award-winning sports broadcaster who joined ESPN and the SEC Network in 2016 as a sideline reporter for both college football and gymnastics. In addition, she serves as a sports reporter and host at AL.com, where she covers a multitude of teams and sports in the state of Alabama. Lauren is passionate about sports, but even more passionate about telling the stories of, their, of the coaches, athletes, and fans who make it more than a game. Her journey was not always full of victories and celebrations. In 2003, as a freshman at Rutgers University, tragedy struck Lauren's world. Through her grief and despair, Lauren found, courage, found the courage to continue moving forward and find success. Lauren now shares her story across the country in hopes of spreading awareness while breaking down the barriers that stand in the way of us living our best lives. And there will be a video intro and then our keynote, Lauren Sisler. Good morning from the junction. This is what SEC football looks like even nine hours before kickoff. Lauren Sisler is with the seven-time national championship coach. Lauren, 
Coach, you got a big smile on your face out here in front of all these fans. You missed out on spring a season ago due to the pandemic. How significant has this period been for the development of your team, especially on offense? And we are rolling. Where are we going, Tuscaloosa? Charles, why don't you tell them why we're going to Tuscaloosa? We're going to go and spend a little time with Coach Saban. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool for me because I've uh, only met him in passing. Hope my shoes don't get dirty down here. about to get freaked out here Without in this Paul. Warehouse 31 Unleashed. So Jatarvius, rumor on the street is that you can do a backflip as a former gymnast. I respect the backflip, but I have to see this for myself. I don't know if I'm worth it, but I know all y'all are worth it today. Woo! We are here. And I am so thankful that all of you are in this room today. You guys made a choice to be here in this room today. You made the choice to show up and to be in this room, to be in fellowship, to be next to those. And we just want to share that love with you today. So, you got a nice little video introduction of my life as a sports reporter. So, of course, I'm going to ask the tough questions. Where are my football fans at in this room? Got a lot of football fans. All right, so where are my Wisconsin Badger fans? So I'm sure you saw a little, a guy on there by the name of Nick Saban, who kind of owns a lot of national championships. So I catch a lot of flack for that. You know, I live in the state of Alabama, but I went to Rutgers University, and oh, by the way, Rutgers is the state university of New Jersey, and oh, by the way, we invented college football back in 1869. What, what? The best part about that, though, however, is, you know, I like to brag about the fact that we invented college football. We don't own any national championships, but when you invent things, like, you were the first to do it. But then the Alabama fans are like, well, we perfected it. Okay, sure, yep, I get it. Um, you have a lot of national championships. But, look, I have not had a chance to cover a Wisconsin game yet. I guess the closest I've gotten, I covered two Minnesota games. Um, we get some boos in the room? Boo. I'll make sure I pass that along to Mr. PJ Fleck for you. Um, was an awesome experience, so I've really enjoyed the opportunity to cover college football. Where are my NFL fans at in here? Okay. So I'm assuming there's got to be a lot of Green Bay Packer fans in the house, I'm sure. Okay. So how many of you in here could care less about sports? There's plenty of you, right? So you'd probably rather be out traveling, traveling the world, doing things that are non-sports related. Hey, I get it. Totally cool. And here's the bottom line. Look, y'all. We all in this world can agree on some things. And there's a lot of things that we disagree on. We all have our own opinions about things. And the one thing, though, that we have in common is we have a story. And the cool part of my job as a sports reporter, I get to ask a lot of questions, and I get to tell stories. Um, any of you all in here play golf? Do I have any golfers in the room here? A couple of golfers? So, like, golf is a cool sport. Sometimes it can be leisurely, but it can also be very frustrating, right? It's like either you're having a good day or a bad day. And as a sports reporter, I ask a lot of questions. Well, sometimes it bleeds over into my personal life. So I talk to my husband. We're out on the golf course. I'm not very good. He played golf in college, so he's pretty good. But uh, sometimes, you know, he might be having an off day. And I go reporter mode on him. John, why did you hit it in the bunker? Why did you slice it into the trees? Why are you having a bad day? Why are you in a bad mood? Hmm, I wonder, because his wife is heckling him and asking far too many questions. So therefore, sometimes I have to settle in. 
So I get to ask a lot of questions and I get to tell stories. And the one thing that we have in common in this room is we all have a story. Every single one of us has a unique story that is bound in beauty and grace. And sometimes it can get very ugly, very ugly. And everyone knows that, right? Everyone has been through the challenges, the disappointments, the ups and downs, the, oh man, I made a major mistake there. I wish I could take that one back. We have all been there, but we all have a story that is uniquely beautiful and is uniquely you. And I want to hear each and every one of your stories. I want you to share your story with the world. I want the world to hear your story because your story matters. You matter. But sometimes it's hard to share our stories. And Kyle, you had the courage and the strength to come up here despite emotion. You stepped up here on the stage and you had the courage and the strength to share your story. Powerful story. One that will impact so many lives, even if just one. But sometimes it's scary. We're embarrassed. We think about things that we've been through, the decisions we've made, the decisions we made back when we were 16, and the decisions we still make when we're, you know, 56. Keep on keeping on, you know? But at the end of the day, you know, when we, when we think about our stories, sometimes we have to take a step back. And we have to realize that our stories are who we are. It's what molds us. It's what shapes us. It's what makes us into who we are. And a lot of times our stories can be that catalyst for strength and growth and resilience. And so I'm going to take a leap of faith today. And I'm going to share with you my personal story and my personal journey. So I'm going to go first. You ready? All right. So here is the Sisler family. That's my mom and my dad. And my older brother, Alan, he's two and a half years older than me. And, you know, we were a happy family growing up. We were always on the go, constantly at school. It was practice. My brother was a three-sport athlete, baseball, football, basketball. You could always find my dad on the sidelines coaching up my brother. My mom, she would usually be taking me to and from gymnastics practice. And a lot of you are probably looking at me like, gymnastics? You were a gymnast? Yeah, true story. Five foot nine, all five foot nine of me was a gymnast. <laughs> Shocker, right? Because look, gymnastics, you know, if you think about these Olympians these days, these elite level athletes in gymnastics, Simone Biles, four foot eight, I got her by over a foot. Hello. But look, when I was three years old, I was bouncing off the walls. My parents were sick and tired of having to take me to the emergency room constantly, dealing with all the stitches and all the broken collarbones and broken bones, and said, okay, we got to do something with this girl. Get in the sport of gymnastics, Woo! let's relieve some of that energy. Smart play by my parents. Little did they know that, well, the sport of gymnastics can get quite expensive. I don't know if any of you folks in here know anything about gymnastics, but it can be a very expensive sport. Um, but it was a sport that I loved, and it was a sport that I grew in and I excelled in and really fell in love with it. So gymnastics just became my sport. That was what I did. That became what I dedicated myself to. And so when I was in middle school, that's when I started realizing that maybe I could go to the next level. Not the Olympic level, not for this monstrosity, uh-uh, no Olympics, not for me. But what about a college scholarship? You know, I'd put so much time and energy and effort. My parents spent so much time and dedication and money in the sport of gymnastics. Maybe I can use the sport of gymnastics to repay them. Maybe I can get a college scholarship that could help with my school because I wanted to be a sports doctor. That was my childhood dream as I was growing up. I wanted to be a sports doctor. And so this could be my ticket to pay for my school, to get my education, and to continue on. And so in middle school, I started out with that mindset, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna go, to go and be a collegiate gymnast. And so you transition into high school. You know, I'm commuting each way to practice over an hour, training 20-plus hours per week, literally devoting so much time. If I wasn't in the gym, you could see me out on the trampoline, jumping around, doing all the things. And... Um, when I got into, I guess it was about junior high, uh, junior high, junior year in high school, that's when I actually had to make that decision of where I was going to go to school. So I'm sending out my recruiting tapes all over the country, y'all, all over the country. And mind you, when I say recruiting tapes, I mean VHS. 
Y'all know about the VHS, right? I'm scanning the room here. Most of you all probably know about VHS. The kids these days, I got to tell you, haven't made. It's literally like upload, click, send, done. I literally stuffed 50 envelopes with my recruiting tape. And I want you guys to see the beauty that is my recruiting tape. Hi, my name is Lauren Sisler. I live in Newport, Virginia. I go to Giles High School. I train at Run Academy of Gymnastics. I drive approximately an hour and a half each way to get there. And these are all the medals and trophies that I've earned. And it's definitely paid off. And I definitely look forward to going to college and experiencing what college gymnastics is all about. How about that? First of all, you guys are like, where in the world are you from? Well, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia. I might have left that part out. This Virginia gal, yes, I do live in the state of Alabama now, but I spent a majority of my childhood in Roanoke, Virginia. We eventually moved out to what I consider the country uh, about an hour outside of Roanoke, Virginia, uh, to Newport, Virginia, and spent a lot of time there. And look, I told you, gymnastics was a big part of my life. We went to competitions all over the, the, the country, and one of the biggest competitions I recall that was one of my favorites, and it's actually in one of those video clips when I was a bit younger, 10 years old, first national gymnastics competition, and I am on the big stage, and I am so excited, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as we go to Orlando. First big road trip with my family. I'm so excited, so fired up. We load up the car. My mom, my dad, my brother, and me. Dad's in the front seat. Coca-Cola and Peanuts. Peanuts inside the Coca-Cola. Have you ever heard of that before? That was his thing. Mom, she usually fresca, some nabs. She used to work for Nabisco, so that was her thing. My brother over there, beef jerky, Mountain Dew, always wired. And then me, you know, I probably, probably a, you know, a Coca-Cola, but I always had a stellar candy stash. Literally everything in this cash box, locked up, alphabetized, was never going to run out of that candy. And I wasn't sharing either. So we're on our way, 10 plus hour drive to Orlando to this gymnastics meet. And I get there and I am just so fired up. Like, oh, this is my big moment. And as I said, at this point, I'm 10 years old. I'm, I'm super excited about this competition. First big national competition for me. And I get out there and I start performing. Hit the first event, hit the second event, hit the third event. And then I get to the final rotation, the balance beam. Woo, buddy, the balance beam. Let's see how this is going to go. I get going. I go through each skill. I'm, whew, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. I've almost got this. I just got to get to the dismount, land the dismount, and, hey, maybe I've got a chance to medal in the all-around. So I get to the final skill before my dismount. It's called a full turn. And a full turn is, well, perhaps one of the easiest skills in the code of points. And unfortunately, as I go to step up to do my full turn, I lose my balance and I fall on a stinking full turn. Are you kidding me? As you can imagine, this 10-year-old that was so excited to be on the big stage was so disappointed. I was disappointed because I felt in that moment maybe I let my coaches down, and even more so my parents, because we had dr driven all this way, spent all this time in the car to get here, and all this money getting to this point in the season, and man, I fell on a stinking full turn. As I lift myself up off the mat and I'm about to get back onto the balance beam, 
It's as if it was silence in the arena. And I hear from afar, my mom jumps out of the stands and she says, don't worry, Lauren, we're still going to Disney World. (laughs) And that, my friends, is the reassurance that I needed that life happens, y'all. We fall down. We fall down time and time and time again. But we got to get back up. We got to keep moving forward at all costs. And we got to celebrate. We got to celebrate life's victories. No victory too big or small. But we also need to celebrate the failures because those failures, if we create space in our hearts for those failures, that is the catalyst that builds strength and resilience and helps us to appreciate this life that we have and the people that we have in it. So I got back up on that balance beam and I knew I was still going to Disney World. And it was absolutely one of the best family trips that I can remember. Something that I just absolutely loved. And it was just a fond memory that I had. And so as I took you through my um, gymnastics career there and kind of gave you some insight into my recruiting process, then as I mentioned, I get to my junior year in high school I get to my senior year, and at this point, no scholarship offers had come in. I had some walk-on opportunities, but still no scholarship offer. And then I get to this regional competition, and I go in, and I compete the routine of my life, and it so happens that the judge was the coach at Rutgers University. And she walked over to me and my parents and said, Lauren, I want to offer you a scholarship. And that was such a proud moment and an exciting moment, and it was like, wow. And I remember looking in my parents' eyes as we hugged and we cried and we just rejoiced that I had made my parents proud. And so now I'm off with the rest of my life in front of me. This Virginia gal is heading up north. So as you can imagine, perhaps maybe like some of y'all were thinking when I stepped up on stage, where is she from? Well, I got that question quite a bit when I was at Rutgers. When I showed up on the scene, you ain't from around here, are you? Nope. But I'll tell you what, they embraced me. They embraced this, this, this person that I was. I was a little bit different, had a different dialect, was a little bit slow at things, although, got my officers in the room, my driving record indicated differently. I wasn't always very slow, a little bit of a lead foot. Um, nevertheless, I loved Rutgers. It was a place that I felt embraced. It's a place that I felt at home. And again, this is, this, I was from Virginia, a small town, and I go to Rutgers, and it was like a straight-up culture shock, but one that I loved and was so grateful for that because I had this new place, this place that I could call home. Fast forward second semester, March 23rd of 2003. I'm studying for my exams, um, and I remember picking up the phone, as I always did, I had such a close relationship with my parents. Even when I went off to college, I still connected and communicated with my parents every single day. Look, I'm going to admit it, y'all. My parents tucked me in every single night until the day that I left for college. And it was important for me to have that relationship and to have that love and that support from them. So we burned up the phone lines, called my parents that evening right before bed, Mom, Dad, hey, how's it going? You know, we talked for a few minutes. My mom asked me how gymnastics practice was going. Oh, how's that new skill you're working on on bars? Gave her the whole play-by-play. She had to know everything. My father, on the other hand, um, you know, he just wanted to talk about life. And he said, Lauren, I am just so proud of you. You know, you're, you're living your dream. You're making things happen. Um, and that was it. We said our I love yous and our goodbyes. And I hung up the phone talked to my roommate for a few minutes, um, had a conversation with her, and then set my alarm clock and fell asleep. A few hours goes by, and I wake up to my phone ringing, the phone that was sitting on the desk, and I grab the phone, and I look at the caller ID, and it said uh, my, my home phone number was scrolled across it. And I knew it was still dark outside, that this was not going to be a good phone call. So I answered the phone with hesitation. Hello? My dad on the other end sounded stressed, frantic. I need to talk to your brother, Lauren. Well, Dad, what's wrong? I I just need to talk to your brother. Dad, please tell me what's wrong. Lauren, your mom died. What? 
what do you mean mom died? I literally just talked to you guys hours ago. It's the middle of the night. What possibly could have happened? He said, Lauren, I can't explain it now. I need you to call your brother, tell him that your mom died and that he needs to come home. He was stationed in, the, in, in Norfolk, Virginia in the Navy. My dad said, get on the next plane you can. I'll be at the airport to pick you up. And so after taking a few moments to really take in what I had heard, um, I started frantically packing my bags. I'm sifting through my closet trying to figure out what in the world I'm going to wear to my mom's funeral. I couldn't believe that I was having to go through these emotions. I, I, all I wanted to do was run and jump in my dad's arms. All I wanted to do was my dad to tell me everything was going to be okay. So I was able to get a ride to the airport. Mind you, I am 18 years old at this point, y'all. I didn't even have a credit card. I had no funding. I had no way to get a plane ticket. My roommate, Kara, had to actually lend me her credit cards so that we could call and get a plane ticket so that I could get home in the first place. I get home, I grab my bags, I run through the terminal, I step outside, and I stand there for a few minutes waiting for my, my dad to show up. And instead it was my uncle and my cousin who pulled up to the airport that day. And um, in that moment as they pull up to the curb, I'm thinking in my mind, you know, my dad's probably just taking care of things. Everything's going to be okay. We get in the car and we start driving. And as we were about to exit the airport, I finally worked up the courage. I said, Uncle Mike, I said, where's my dad? He stopped the car and still to this day, I can feel the gravel underneath the car as he put it in park and he turned around and looked at me and said, Lauren, I'm sorry, but your dad passed away too. And in an instant, my entire world turned upside down. What? How could this happen? How could this happen to me? How could this happen to my family? How could this happen to two people that loved and were so loved by everyone around them? Two weeks after burying both of my parents, I had a decision to make. And I had to decide if I was going to go back to school and what I was going to do in that process. <sighs> so do I go back to school or do I sit here and, and just take some time off? Well, my aunt and uncle sat me down and had that conversation. They said, Lauren, you got to go back to school. You have a commitment to yourself, your university, your teammates. You have to go back to school. So in that moment, I thought, okay, well, I guess I don't have an option. I'm going back to Rutgers. I'm going back to school. So two weeks after burying both of my parents, I went back to school. And let me tell you, it was an absolute roller coaster ride. I was... I mean, A's and B's was the norm for me. I had a 396 GPA when I graduated from high school. Next thing you know, C's and D's. Now I'm making F's on papers, F's in lab class. I mean, I am struggling. I'm always injured. I'm in and out of the, the, the training room. I can't compete. I can't be there for my teammates. I try to study. I lose focus. There were times I would actually go into my room, my dorm room, by myself when my roommate wasn't there and pick up the phone and pretend I was talking to my parents because I was trying to escape reality. I was trying to take myself to a different place. And I wasn't facing reality. That first summer when I went home from Rutgers, I'll never remember, I'll never forget standing in my living room of the house that my parents had built that we had spent the last three or four years in. And a moving truck came up the driveway. And this woman came out of the, the moving truck along with a few men. They walked into our house. And within two hours, had everything boxed up, taken off the walls, every piece of furniture, every piece of clothing, every single item in that house was boxed up, taped up, put on a truck, and shipped off to be auctioned to complete strangers. My parents didn't have a will. They had nothing. The estate was in debt, and everything was going under. Everything was falling out from underneath my feet. And I couldn't believe this as I'm watching this unfold in front of me. And so really all that was left for my brother and I were just some pictures and a few small things to remember my parents by. It was difficult, and I was, I was struggling so hard. I went back to Rutgers. I continued on. Finally, after another semester of really just drowning in my sorrows, my coaches and teammates kind of band together and sat me down and had a conversation with me, a conversation that was a lot of love, but also a lot of tough love. And they said, look, Lauren, we love you. We want to help you. We want to help you get through this. But you've got to stand up and you've got to take the first step. 
You have to take that first step. We can't do it for you. And so after I'd spent this year of really just throwing myself this awesome pity party, I realized, like, I've got to take control. I've got to regain control. If I don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for me. And so after some help and some encouragement, some guidance, I started going to counseling. I started getting tutors. I started getting help with my grades. And everything started to change in my world. Everything around me started to change. Everything started to open up. And honestly, I felt like I could breathe. I felt like now I wasn't suffocating anymore and that I could breathe and I was starting to reestablish and regain my identity and who I was and who I wanted to be. So I was fortunate in 2006, I still graduated with a degree in communications on time, didn't have to extend my schooling, didn't have to do the extended plan. I'm sure some of y'all know what that's all about. Sometimes you just Sometimes it just takes a little longer. I'm thankful that didn't happen. However, I've taken the extended plan in a lot of other areas of my life, so that's just the way it goes. Um, I graduate, and now I have this broadcasting career in front of me. I am so excited for this opportunity to uh, be a sports broadcaster. So I bounce around to different stations because, you know, a lot of people ask, like, you know, ESPN, that's so cool. How did you get there? Well, let me tell you, I got there by starting out at very small little towns, small little markets, and working my way up, making a lot of mistakes, and really just getting reps in constantly, rep after rep after rep. Think about my first on-air sports job as a sports reporter in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Okay, y'all, so Parkersburg, West Virginia, they do a lot of high school football, and there was this show, and it was called Football Frenzy. And I'm up here on the anchor desk with uh, the sports director. And um, he says, all right, you ready for this? I said, yeah, I'm ready. And I could feel my nerves starting to hype up a little. And I'm like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And then the, the light comes on the camera. We are live. The show open rolls. Welcome into Football Frenzy. Hey, we've got a new co-host. Why don't you introduce yourself? And I looked into that camera. It was like the red meter. You know, you see those old cartoons. Like, my face just filled up with redness. I was like, what just happened? Like, how am I going to be a sports reporter or a sports broadcaster if I can't even speak? Forgot my name, where I was from. Could not think of anything to say. I was terrified. I was mortified. Yes. Terrifying incident. And then, about a year later, well, this happened. You ready? The women's NCAA tournament tipped off this weekend, and the West Virginia Lady Mountaineers got their first taste of competition today in round one as they took on AC in Houston. And thanks to Liz Rappellis, 26 points. And Medina's 15 rebounds. The Lady Mountaineers earned a spot in the 79-73 victory over the Cougars. West Virginia ended their season, and now they're going on to round two. Well, spring is officially here, and as of today, they closed out, Marietta Pioneers closed out their homestand in the Southeast Ohio Invitational. <laughs> We're scoreless to the bottom of the second. Evan Brockmeyer will start things off for the Pioneers. He gets the bunt and the sack error. Now, Evan Grillio up to bat. He smacks it to left center for the RBI double. Brockmeyer will come in for the unearned run, and the Pioneers will pick up a 1 0 lead. All right, so I got a question for y'all. <laughs> Was I laughing or crying? Because honestly, I don't even know how to answer that. Like, it was a little bit of both. Like, I had this little snafu with a button on my shirt, and we were in another segment. I was trying to fix it real quick, and I'm quickly fixing it, and I pop my head up, and I'm on camera, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, did someone see me, like, unbuttoning and rebuttoning my shirt? So my mind was in a different place. I was, like, scrambling, oh, my gosh, what just happened? And once I get tickled, like, I can't lose it. Like, it is so hard. I'm like, what do I even think about right now? How am I going to to like figure this out. So yeah, that was a a moment in time. And you know, y'all look, I mean, life sometimes goes off script. Life goes off script all the time. Thankfully, I still got another chance. I was still able to continue moving forward, was able to continue getting more reps, continue making more mistakes and continue working my way up the ranks. So after I graduated from WTAP in Parkersburg, West Virginia. I landed in Birmingham, Alabama in 2011. So 2011, um, 
was a was a big year for me. Alabama, great state to cover sports. Obviously, we have uh, you know the Alabama Crimson Tide. I mentioned that the Auburn Tigers. Lots of great schools in the state. We have NASCAR. Do we have any NASCAR fans in here? Woo! Yes. Talladega, baby. Have you ever been to Dega? If not, you need to get there. You have. Talladega is amazing. Talladega is like the biggest track on the circuit. Um, pretty good stuff. Some crazy things happen there. We won't go there, but nevertheless. Um, Alabama was a great place to cover sports and I really was able to get my feet wet and really able to just learn and continue to grow and finally in 2016 I got my first shot at being a reporter for ESPN and kind of how that works is you know they saw some of my work at CBS 42 the local CBS affiliate I was also working and still currently work at AL.com Alabama.com which is a digital news and sports site and I said, all right, we're going to give this girl a chance. My first college football game on the sidelines. Was I good? No. Was I okay? Mm, I mean, debatable. Um, but the key is everyone has to start somewhere, right? I had to start somewhere. There's a lot that I didn't know, a lot that I wished I would have known. But I got through it. I figured out. And I got a phone call again later that year to do another game and then I got another phone call and I got another phone call so thankfully I was able to continue growing and continue getting a little bit better but one question I often get from people is like do you still get nervous when you go on national TV uh yeah were you nervous getting up here a little nervous do you all get nervous talking in front of people Okay, suddenly when you think on the other side of that camera, there's a million people at home watching. Everything I say and do is being analyzed with a microscope. Yeah, so yes, I get nervous. But one way I combat that is what I call the sideline shimmy. So I gave you a little sampling of that in my um, video, but here, here's, here is the sideline shimmy from the beginning of this season. So look, that keeps me loose. It gets me loosened up. It gets me ready to shimmy, shimmy, shake, shake. Jennifer and I were doing the sideline shimmy here just a little bit ago. It calms my nerves. It helps with the adrenaline. But I'm going to tell you something about that video. So when I did the sideline shimmy a few years ago, I just posted it on social media. Everyone was like, oh, my gosh, sideline shimmy, that's so funny. Ha, ha, ha. You need to keep doing that. So all of a sudden, I got to keep doing it. So I posted that on social media. And let me tell you all, you all know about the comment section, right? People got an opinion. Lots of people have an opinion. You give them a cell phone, you give them some internet, you give them some social media. They hide behind that wall. And you know what we call those people? We call them trolls. When the trolls come out. So let me tell you all about this troll. And again, I try not to read the comments, but, you know, it was entertaining for a little while. Whoa, well, boy, some guy um, got on there and his comment to me was, kind of young to have bingo arms. Anybody know what bingo arms are? You know that little flap right here? Do, 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 do. That's called bingo arms. And guess what? We all have bingo arms. Every single one of us has bingo arms. I even talked to my trainer, who is an NFL trainer, um, used to be in the NFL, my man Lewis Sanders, and he says, Lauren, I played in the NFL for nine years. I got bingo arms. Whoop! And he showed them to us. I was like, you know, it's good to know. So let me just tell you, you give somebody a computer, you give somebody social media, you give somebody a wall to hide behind, they're going to say something. They're going to do whatever they can to break you down. But let me tell y'all, don't let someone with a computer and social media and some avatar, you can't even see their face, to break you down and to define your self-worth. Because guess what? They ain't worth it. That's what I say. Don't ever let someone rain on your parade. And today, I'm here to encourage you, we're trading up the rain for the confetti, my friends. No more rain. It's confetti every day, all day. And I share this image with you because in life and in sports broadcasting, 
And when I stand on that football field, you know, it used to be like, oh, cool, like TV, like I get to interview some of these awesome people. But what I started to realize is it's not about the wins and the losses. It's not about what the scoreboard says. To me, it's about the stories. It's the stories on the field. It's the stories that make it more than a game. It's the stories of each and every player, each and every coach, each and every fan, every single person that steps foot on that field, whether it's the football field or the field of life that has a story. That confetti to me, every single piece of confetti represents a story, layers of stories. And truth be told, my vision of that was once blurred because I was ashamed to share my story. A lot of you all are probably sitting in this room right now saying, is Lauren going to share the part of her story of what happened to her parents? Was anybody in this room, let's be honest, was anybody in this room curious, like what happened to Lauren's parents that day? Right? Well, the answer to that, 10 years ago, no. I would not have stood on this stage and shared my story because I was ashamed of my story. I kept running from reality. I didn't want people to know my story. But here I stand now, willing and open and ready to be honest with each and every one of you. Years ago, on the outside, I was the first one on the dance floor, last one to leave, just having the time of my life. But on the inside, I was struggling. I was drowning. I was losing my identity. I was losing who I was. On the outside, I was this beautiful brand new car with the shiny wheels, but on the inside, I was a hot mess. I wanted people to see this girl that was thriving and making it, and despite losing both of her parents, everything was fine, everything was okay. But it wasn't okay. And for me, I continued to run from reality. So you know what I did? I told people when they said, how did your parents die? Well, I told a sugar-coated story. Well, my mom died of respiratory failure. My dad died of a heart attack. Truth of it is, yes, my mom died of respiratory failure, but my mom, died, my mom died of respiratory failure because she ingested a lethal amount of fentanyl. That's how my mom died. My dad, well, in my mind, died of a heart attack. Well, yes, his heart stopped because he went into respiratory failure because he, too, ingested a lethal amount of fentanyl. So I had wired my brain to tell people that's what happened because to me the word addiction and overdose could not be used in the same sentence with both of my parents. My parents didn't struggle with addiction. No, there's no way my parents could be weak, that they could lose their strength and that they could lose their battle to something like addiction. My parents, no, that's not possible. So I told this story over and over and over again because that's what I wanted people to believe. That's what I wanted the world to believe because in my mind, their legacy was bound in my hands and it was up to me to preserve their legacy at all cost. And the price tag of that for me was shame. So for years and years and years, I ran from reality. For seven years, y'all, I ran from reality. I ignored the truth of what happened to my parents. Finally, about seven years after running, my auntie Linda, my mom's sister, finally started to break those walls down. She said, Lauren, look, you can't change the opinions of others. You can't influence the opinions of others. You can't change what happened to your parents. But the bottom line is your parents aren't defined by how they died. Your parents are defined by how they lived their lives. And that to me was so profound because I realized that my parents were great people. They were loving people. They were wonderful people. And the way that they died did not define how they lived their lives. And now I'm not going to allow how they died to define my life. I'm going to step up and I'm going to share the truth. So at seven years, I started to accept the truth. At the 10-year mark, it was the first time I ever opened up the envelope with the toxicology reports. It was the first time I read on a piece of paper what happened to both of my parents. Because for me, if I didn't read it on paper, it never happened. I could make up this lie, make up this story, and nobody would know. Not even myself would know. So at the 10-year mark, I started sharing their story and becoming more and more encouraged to share their story. And you see, for me, 
as a sports reporter, it is my job to find stories, to tell stories, and to show people how people are shaped by their stories. These athletes and these coaches and these amazing people, every single day, they are shaped by something in their life. And it is my job to, to, to take people there, to help them to understand how it is that they got to where they are today. And for me, I was just living in this shell of myself. I could not come out with the truth. But as I started to, to share the truth, to be more vulnerable, to be more courageous, those shackles of shame started to release themselves. And I started to realize that my parents are no different than me or any of you in this room today. My parents got caught up in addiction. Both of my parents going to a pain management doctor. Both of my parents struggling with chronic pain. Both of my parents struggling with addiction. And over a four-year period, they eventually became addicted to their medications. But my parents are no different than me and you. None of us are exempt from life's difficult circumstances. Nobody is exempt from life's difficult circumstances. It doesn't matter the size of your house, the car that's sitting out in the driveway, the clothes that you wear, none of those material things matter. And at this point, once I'd finally acknowledged that both of my parents had died of drug overdoses and that I wasn't going to allow that pain to be harbored inside of me and I started speaking the truth and sharing the truth, finally, the shame had been set free. Finally, no more guilt And I could speak speak freely about my parents. And I still love them the same. I love them the same from the day that I was born until the day that they died and now standing here just 19 years after they died. How amazing that was. And I'm going to check the time here because I do want to share one more story with you. Oh, I got a little more time. So I'm going to get a little emotional here. So forgive me. I prepared myself. I got emotional when you were sharing your story. So as an advocate now for those struggling with addiction, those struggling with substance use, those struggling with mental health disorders, I've had this opportunity to go out and share my story and my parents' story and my family's story. In September... I went out to my high school, 20 years after I'd graduated from my high school, and was able to share with the entire student body, 8th through 12th grade. And let me tell you, I left that high school just the way it was. Everything about that high school was exactly how I remember it. They might have put some paint on the walls, but the technology was exactly the way I remember it. Little projector screen, computer hooked to the, the speaker. Oh, let me put the speaker up here so you can hear my video. But I loved it. I embraced it. I was like, this is home. Like, this is, the, this is the best. So later that night, I found out that as I was sharing my story, <clears throat> there was a young man that was there in the audience that day, one of the students. And he went home and he told his father, there was this sports reporter that came to the school today and she shared her story. She shared her story and he starts recounting the things that I had shared. And his father immediately knew who I was. Not because I'm a sports reporter on TV. His father was the sheriff that responded to the call the day that my parents died. He was the first one on the scene. And he said he remembers walking in that house that day. My dad of course, lying on the floor, no longer alive. And they had to search the house while EMS tried to do what they could. He walked around the house. He went up to my bedroom, and on the wall, he saw all of my medals and trophies. And he saw those medals and trophies and thought about all the hard work that went into achieving those medals and trophies. And he thought about the young girl that had to leave New Jersey and come home to this incredible burden. How was this little girl, this young girl, going to get through this? He then said he said a prayer for me. 
And then he continued walking through the house and said, you know, nothing makes sense here. None of this fits. None of this, this, this is a happy family. This, is, this doesn't make sense. And then he said there are very few cases that he has worked in the last 18 years that he's been on the force, 19 years now, um, that have been as profound as this one. And he said this is one that has really resonated with him and has stuck with him like none other. And the last thing he said to me, in this message, he said, look, he said, most people, most children that experience what you did would go on to experience the same fate, would follow in a similar path. And I'm so thankful that wasn't you, and I'm so thankful you were able to pull yourself out of it, Lauren. And he said, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and he said, I'm so thankful for that, and I celebrate those moments when they come back like that, when they come full circle. But here's the thing I think that was lost on me. When I look back, I didn't think I had a choice. Like, I didn't have a choice. Like, this happens, you put on the boots, you keep moving forward. I didn't have a choice. But the reality of it is, y'all, I had a choice every single day. Every time I woke up, I had a choice. You're either going to go with A or B. What's behind door number one? What's behind door number two? And that has been lost on me for so many years because I felt like I didn't have a choice. But y'all, we all have a choice. We all have a choice in this life. Are we going to choose grief and despair and resentment for our history, for our mis mistakes, for the decisions that we made? Are we going to unpack our bags in sorrow and just live there for the rest of our lives? Or are we going to pack up our bags and move to where there is gratitude and joy? And that is what I want to encourage each and every one of you. Pack up your bags and keep moving forward no matter what it is that you've been through. We all have a choice to make in this. We all have a choice in how we're going to continue to move forward. Choose gratitude and joy. Because to me, gratitude is such a gift, such a gift to give it, to receive it, to cherish it. And gratitude to me, as I've re realized the silver linings that have been part of my life since this traumatic event that happened in March of 2003, one thing, one gift that I've taken from it is I feel so thankful and I feel so much gratitude for the people that have come into my life, the people that have surrounded me, the love and support, the, the hardships, everything. Finding that gratitude is so important. And I think that if we can rewire our way of thinking and think about that gratitude, it is such a cherished gift. And before I step off this stage, and I think we might have, have time for a couple of questions, I want to leave you with this. You all made a choice, as I said from the beginning, to be in this room today. You all have a story. Every single person in this room has a story. I want to encourage each and every one of you to fall in love with your story. By all means, fall in love with your story. As you walked into this room today, you decided to be here, to be in fellowship, to be with everyone in this room, showing love and support. And I think that we have to look at this event, the first ever We Heart Who event. And I think the one thing that I take from this is love. Unconditional love. And what these organizations are all about, what Breakwater has tried to provide, the Breakwater Coalition, what Solutions Recovery, and all these great organizations that are supporting this amazing event year number one, and hopefully the first of many. We are here in a community. We are here in a community that is filled with hope. We are here in a community that wants to inspire, that wants to encourage, and that ultimately wants to provide each and every one of you with unconditional love. So I want to encourage you all to love yourselves better and to love one another better. And so we're going to start with the first exercise. I want you to look to your left, and I want you to look to the person to your left and say, I love you. <laughs> now look to your left 
and say, I love you. Don't worry, I'm going to leave that person out. And lastly, I want you to raise your hand, put your hand on your heart, and I want you to tell yourself, I love you. And now this room is filled with so much love, so much unconditional love, that I hope that you will use this as an opportunity to go out and spread this love with the world. Let's go. was. I didn't understand what addiction was because guess what, y'all? What are we here for to break down the stigma of addiction? In my mind, addiction is the homeless man, the person that can't keep a job, the person that is dysfunctional, right? We hear that word dysfunctional all the time. Guess what, y'all? We all just dysfunctional, okay? But with that being said, my father overdosed at Thanksgiving. We woke up on Thanksgiving morning. This was prior to their passing in March. Woke up Thanksgiving morning to my father on the couch, barely breathing. We were able to call EMS. They came out. They were able to um, get him to the hospital. We were able to uh, help him through, obviously, um, everything. We as a family, my brother and I specifically, were told that my father had a bad reaction to medication. In my mind, as an 18-year-old, that was... Oh, well, you took your cholesterol medicine, your heart pressure medicine, it must have had a little mixture, concoction, whatever, and that's what happened. So I went back to school with no idea. So at the end of the day, there were signs. Now, my father told my mom that day that he had read online that you could take the fentanyl, put it in the freezer, cut it open. That's how he overdosed. But we, on the outside, so my parents did a very good job of keeping their addiction under wraps to where people on the outside had questions, would sometimes... But to me, my dad falling asleep on the couch was simply a product of, I'm tired. I've had a long week at work. And that was it, you know. My parents, to me, were taking their medications. That's what the doctors told them. I had no idea that they were taking more than they were prescribed, and it eventually had gotten to where they couldn't um, control it anymore. Yeah. So back there, white jacket. And what's your name? Pop that mic up, I think. Mute. I think there's a, yeah. Yeah, it's on now. There we go. Uh, my name is Wei. Yeah, and it's a Chinese name, but it's easy to remember. No way you will forget my name, Wei. No way! I yes. love it! <laughs> and thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing that so touching and inspiring story of yours. I was badly touched. I, I even used my mother-in-law's T-shirt to wipe my tears. Aww. Yes, I didn't actually uh, 
went through anything like bad as you did. But it's really, you know, I really, really uh, touched by you how you went through the process, like you said. You have to cheer up every day and say, yeah, I'm a cheerful, cheerful girl and I work so hard, but inside you were suffering so badly. And my question is like, uh, you mentioned about your brother and I'm wondering like, uh, how about him? How like uh, your parents uh, thing influence him? And yeah, this my curiosity. Yes, thank you. Great, great question. Thank you, Wei. I appreciate that. I will, no way I'll forget the name. And thank you for your kind words. It means a lot. And first of all, one thing I want to say, as you, as you think about, you said you had never been through maybe something similar. But y'all, the lived experiences we have, our traumas are our traumas. And I think a lot of times we struggle with the thought of like, oh, well, I didn't go through something that bad. But your lived trauma is your lived trauma. And so you've been through whatever it is you've been through, and that is your lived experience. And what I've been through does not take away from that. And what you've experienced is profound for you. And I think that's where we can encourage each other, you know, as, as we're going through this. I want to be a, a, a sounding board. I want to be a great listener for that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, my brother was in the Navy. He spent 12 years in the Navy. Uh, as I mentioned, st uh, stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. He was a parachute rigger. Did three deployments and then eventually got out of the Navy. And, you know, for him, I think um, there, were, there were some things that he struggled with. A lot of it, too, I think, was figuring out where he wanted to go next. What was he going to do with his life and his career? And, um, you know, I would say that my brother and I have grown closer over the years. We have continued to grow closer. We were always close when we were younger, but always nitpicking and punching each other and always having, you know, fights about dumb stuff. But we have grown closer you know, and I think he's probably responded differently, maybe more in silence, right? I'm up here on the stage sharing my story. He hasn't, you know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't necessarily come out and talk about it in the open, but he's not afraid to share it. And, you know, I would just say that my brother has, um, you know, kind of used the military, I think, to help him sort of fight, fight back. You know, he deployed, he sort of kept moving on. And sometimes he had to sort of tell me, hey, Lauren, like, we got to keep moving forward. Put on the boots, pull up the bootstraps, let's go. And so I think in some ways I inherited some of that soldier mentality, but then I realized at some points it worked against me because I wanted to do everything on my own. And it's like, no, 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 we've got people here to help. So, you know, I would say that's kind of different. Um, too, my dad was in the Navy, so I think he kind of built that same wall up. But that's a great question. And, you know, like I said, my brother and I were really close. Um, he lives in Alabama and, you know, we really have a great time together. And, um, yeah, uh, it's just, it's been a journey and we share a lot of great memories together. So thank you. All right. Do we have time for one more, Jennifer? Do we do? We do? Okay. I'll, I'll try to be more condensed and concise in my answers. Hi, my name is Teresa and I am just, um, thank you for sharing your story, but, um, I would just uh, like for you to comment on um, grief and your grief support. I, I feel like sometimes that is stigmatized and overlooked often. So I was just wondering what kind of um, grief support that uh, you were able to receive and what's available for people. Yes. Thank you, Teresa. I appreciate that. So grief support, it's an interesting journey and an interesting um, cycle, I would say, for me, because as I kind of outline my story, like, how did you not know your parents died of overdose? Of course, like, how do you not know? And it's like I would crack open the door and try to, like, start stepping through it, and then I'd slam it right back in everyone's face. Nope, not going to address it, not going to talk about it, and that was years and years and years. So when I went back to Rutgers, well, you can go get a counselor. Well, truth be told, that's what they said you I needed, so I kind of was like, okay, but i it, it was good enough at the time, but as I started to heal, I, I graduated and had quit going to a counselor. And then years went by, and I realized, wait a sec, there's a lot that I need to figure out. I don't know about y'all. How many people in here see therapists and counselors? I do all the time. Let me tell you, I walk into her room sometimes. I sit down and think, I have nothing to talk about today. Not a darn thing do I need to talk about. I am A-OK. -okay. And then I get in there, and I can't shut up. <laughs> ongoing conversation so I think a lot of times sometimes we got to get ahead of it before it, it catches up to us and so I think counseling is obviously so profound but also groups and I will say part of the grief counseling for me 
was a lot of this. And I say that, you know, obviously I'm standing on stage talking to hundreds of people, but there was a time as I started to build up to that opportunity or to the ability to share my story. I might only be able to share with my colleague or two people or three people. I mean, this was a long journey that got me there. So for me, being able to share open up, whether it's in a safe, anonymous space um, or a, a, a group that was not anonymous, that to me was really helpful. But I think from a standpoint of, of grief counseling, I've gone to you know, Al-Anon meetings, I have just surrounded myself with people. But for me, the more that I became transparent and vulnerable, the more that I just felt like this weight was lifted off my shoulders because I quit caring about what other people thought. And at the end of the day, when I started sharing, more people were like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I now know what happened to your parents. I still love them the same. They still did everything for you and your brother. They were loving people. That doesn't change my thought of who they were. I'm just glad I know, and now I can go out and talk about it and help other people that might be going through the same thing. So that was one layer, but in terms of the grief, grief counseling specifically, you know, they had the resources at Rutgers that really helped. But I just encourage you, and it's not always going to be the same therapist or counselor. You will meet with someone that's like, oh, uh, just I'm not feeling it. Try a couple different people, you know, see what works for you. See what setting works for you. Is it more of a one-on-one -on -one or is it more of group? And then just kind of go from there. But I think there's a lot of counseling services, and I think they can probably answer that for some of the services that are around here. But I'm telling you, even if you think you've got nothing to talk about, nothing to share, and I am like a warrior and I don't have anything wrong with me, that is the furthest thing. And it, is, it has helped me and empowered me. I started going back to a counselor just two years ago, and it has been the most eye-opening experience because now not only have I gone through those stages of grief, but I'm now creating this awareness. I want to know now why I started doing certain things, why my behaviors are what they are. I want answers to the why, and I've started to create space to feel emotion, right? So I cry. I'm upset. I'm sad. I lost my parents, or I went through this thing. I cry. I let it out, and then afterwards, I'm like, why does my body feel this way? And then almost in a way, it's a release, and I feel this freedom in many ways. And so I think the more awareness we can bring to our Bodily functions, our mind, our spirit, our soul, everything, it can help to benefit us in so many ways. So hopefully that answers your question just a little bit. Thank y'all. Yeah, Thank you. I just, yeah. So I, I gave Laura, yeah, you don't have to put it on. It's your... It's your pass. It'll get you in any door, a great table, whatever you need. 